My guest today is John Morton, screenwriter of a new show on Acorn called Dead Still. John, I'm so excited to have you here on this show for so many reasons. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. I could not believe the publicity that I saw for Dead Still. I read something that announced that the show was coming out and it said it all revolves around a post-mortem photographer and their photo mysteries throughout the thing. And I thought, a whole show on photography and photo history and post-mortem, it's bound to be a hit. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, yeah, it, it's it's been really interesting seeing the response to it. I think because it is it's quite a different subject than maybe has been, uh, you know, broached in a lot of shows before, particularly when it comes to crime fiction. Yeah, people have been very enthused about it, which has been lovely. You've got a one hundred percent must watch on uh, Rotten Tomatoes, oh, which is a web site that rates yeah. movies and TV shows. I was looking at another review today. And it was saying, should you watch or shouldn't you watch? And it was, again, 100%, you must watch this show. So you have created something truly unique. And I would like to know, what's the inspiration for a show based on something people consider sort of creepy? It certainly is a very creepy subject for a show. I guess um, the, the two central things that kind of really inspired me were, were simultaneously the ideas of obviously post-mortem photography and memorial photography, but then also crime scene photography. And I think just in, uh, the, the initial impulse actually was f for the show was an idea I had some years ago. I'm very interested in photography and always have been. Yeah, I was coming across, you know, the photograph that uh, Louis Daguerre had taken, I think, in 1838, which is, you know, apparently the first photograph taken with human subjects in it, which was a street shot and, you know, that he had taken in France because of obviously the, the long exposure times, the only people that were caught in the photograph was it was a man who was having his uh, shoe, sh shoe shined on the street you know it's been regarded as uh, the first human subjects in a, in a photograph and I remember getting to thinking you know you know the idea of if somebody if a criminal was caught in a in the act of murder let's say and they were caught by a photographer and they had never seen a, a camera before and they didn't even know what a camera was that would be a really interesting premise for a show you know a, a, a very early you know photographer in the the formative years of photography been kind of haunted by this killer and that was the initial impulse and then just i guess through research i realized as i was reading reading more about the history of photography and there had been an interest in memorial photography outside of that and i i had realized that mem memorial photography as a trend and as a, a kind of tradition in terms of victorian mourning culture it kind of reached its apex by the end of the 1870s, going into the 1880s, and then in the 1880s, that was really when crime scene photography began to take a foothold. And I just saw the parallels between two different types of photography that potentially focused on the photographing of the dead, one of which was kind of on the way out and one of which was on the way in. And it felt like the, the two things dovetailed quite nicely. So that set up the idea of a memorial photographer as the practice is waning the kind of, I suppose, the early seeds of crime scene photography being developed. Mm. Now, it's billed as a Canadian television show, but also Acorn lists it as an Irish show. So where are you, where are you coming to us from? Uh, I am very much coming from Ireland and the Irish perspective. It's, it, it's an Irish-Canadian co-production. The show has been, it's been in development for a couple of years um, here in Ireland and then you know these things take an awful long time to to get moving and it's kind of changed around quite a bit in the last couple of years but the production companies behind it Deadpan are the Irish company and 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 Shaftesbury in you know in, in in Canada then as well and they came together and they just thought it was uh, the, pot the potential I mean it's very much an Irish show it's set in Dublin in 1880 but I think, you know, the potential for something that actually maybe appealed to people across the world was was evident in the material. Like, it, it's very Irish, but it's not um, prohibitively. And I think that uh, the, the death practices that are shown and also in terms of crime investigation and photography, I think, you know, it, it, it's relatable, I think, to anybody who has a, has a fascination with crime fiction or a hunger for those kind of, those kind of works. Right. It's set in Dublin. 
Set in Dublin, yeah, in, in 1880, which was a time in Dublin historically where photography was really, really, you know, Ireland uh, historically kind of has a tendency to come to things a little bit later than a lot of other places, certainly more so at the time, particularly as it was uh, a time where Ireland was still part of Britain. And it was, a, it was a very interesting time in terms of photography because it was it was a time where a lot of amateur clubs were flourishing in Dublin and photography just suddenly had become this pursuit of, whereas for years it had been the preserve of people who would have been more well-to-do. By around the 1880s, cameras were becoming cheaper and photography was becoming more commonplace and there was a lot more studios. So it felt like a very fertile time to set the show. I mean, it's a fascinating show. I wasn't sure what to expect and then I binged watched the entire thing over the weekend. <laughs> just to make sure that I had watched the whole thing. And I have a question for you about the characters. Now, the characters, the chemistry be- between the characters is so good, you know, between the uncle and the niece, and even Malloy, the gravedigger, who then becomes a photographer. Are, are any of these characters, including the main character, the photographer, based on a real person that you might have read about, or are they all composites? They're mostly composites, for the most part. I think uh, for for Malloy, one of the central inspirations for um, Malloy was an Irish photographer called Arthur Fields. There was a uh, a documentary made about him a a few years ago called Man on Bridge. He was a, was a basically a street photographer who stood on O'Connell Bridge in Dublin for numerous decades taking pictures of just passers-by and he would sell the photographs to them but after he died they discovered that he had the he had thousands upon thousands of images of people and it was a very just fascinating story just this idea of someone who's quietly taking photos of street scenes and of people all his life and then it becomes a discovered after his death. So those aspects don't really, they're kind of slightly touched on with Malloy, but he, the idea of this character who, particularly a, a working class character, who, who sees the potential and sees the value in documenting street scenes and documenting maybe more working class neighborhoods and parts of the city that otherwise maybe wouldn't have been photographed. And uh, so that was kind of where I positioned him as this the, the potential of someone who who loved the idea of street photography and saw the potential in photography to actually document where he was from and the people around him and his society and culture. And what about Blenheim Hassett? Blenheim Hassett, there, there wasn't really any specific reference for him. You know, there's a mix of things. Like it's, it's more like, I think Oscar Wilde was, a, was always a bit of a touchstone for, for Blenheim Hassett as a character. But in terms of photographers, there really wasn't anyone specifically. He was a composite of a lot of different artistic types more so because he very much sees himself as as an artist rather than this kind of run-of-the-mill kind of functional photographer who's just going to show up and do any gig he's very precise and he's very fussy and he sees himself as being um, a pioneer and particularly when it comes to memorial photography he feels that he is he's the best and that he holds himself to a very high artistic standard in that regard Post-mortem photography, people find it fascinating. Well, I posted a photograph online once and said, what do you see in the photograph? Because I try to educate people as to looking at clues. And the number one answer, now this was a family where I think they were all alive at the time, but the number one response was, the mother is dead. And so postmortem photography has this otherworldly fascination. People think that it's more common than it was, and it was fairly common. But how was it done? There's this reading into the images, like if this person actually looks alive, they're actually not alive. It's the photographer who made them look alive. And some of that plays out in, in Dead Still, where... Lennon Hassett really poses people, or obviously actors and actresses who, who actually are alive, but he <laughs> poses them like they're deceased, making them look lifelike with all of their family. When you started writing this and researching it, was there a photograph, like a postmortem photograph, that triggered this for you? That you said, this is fascinating, this is interesting, and this would be a great place to start to weave in postmortem photography and as you're right criminal photography 
Yeah, there was, there was a photograph that I'd seen of, I can't remember exactly when it was dated, but it, it yeah, we presume it probably would have been around 1850s or 1860s, I think. It was two brothers who had died in an accident and they were posed with the rest of their family. And in comparison, they obviously looked quite dead because they were, but the, the, there was just something in the composition and the fact that they were, they were sat up and I'd never really seen that before. You know, I'd seen elements of, of, of mourning photography and portraiture, but it was usually kind of deathbed photography, but never really anything where, where the deceased subject was actually in some small way made to look like they were alive. And I found that fascinating. Like, um, it's, it's obviously quite tragic, but there is, there's a certain, not that it's humorous, but there's, there's something kind of blackly comic in that, the process of actually going out of your way and trying to make someone look, look alive. And that also felt like, yeah, it was, we love, the treatment of death in the show is, you know, you very obviously try not to be disrespectful, but there is a slight absurdness to it that I think you can kind of tap a bit of a comic vein with. And that certainly started my fascination with it. And the more then that I looked at memorial photography, you know, the more you see incidents like that, there's photographs that you can look at where you can't discern who the dead person is. And then there's other ones that you're that you know you see where the person looks very very obviously dead, and there's degrees of decomposition, and so the, there's a there, and there's such a wide range of them, which was what I found really fascinating. There's so many different types of memorial photograph and the ways in which people did it, and it varied you know from family to family depending on what their feelings were or what the the, the practices would have been at the time or what certainly the family would have been comfortable with. Well, it's a dark topic. Oh yeah, it's an extremely dark topic, and I think the you know the Victorian attitude to death is quite removed from our own. So I guess that's why we kind of find it fascinating when we're looking back on it now. And these photographers, like Flynn and Hassett, I think the ones who who took the absolutely perfect postmortems, consider themselves artists. Yeah, like it's certainly one of the creative liberties that I took with 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 the, with the story in the show is that you know Bl- Blenner Hassett was trained as a mortician and he has those skills so what sets him apart from anyone else that might have taken photographs of bodies at the time is that he has a very particular way in terms of posing them and he's quite artistic with his choices and he's also quite he's quite skilled and quite deft at making the subjects look alive and that's why he's as popular as he is whereas you know in the most part when it when it came to postmortem photography the photographers would just come in and would usually be a mortician who would, would have done an awful lot of the the other work and there was incidents of photographers who would have posed bodies but certainly we take it just a little bit step uh, a little bit further in terms of what Blenner Hassett does the, the degrees to maybe which he goes to create the kind of perfect portraits for the families yeah indeed so you have this idea and you decide to write the script. Is that how it started? You decide to write a script or you decide to write a short story? I was very keen to do something in terms of Victorian Ireland because it's not, like as, as, as far as I can tell, and I could be wrong here, I think this is the first you know, TV series slash film that's actually been, been set in Victorian Ireland. There's a number of novels, but it just felt like a really rich time that was quite untapped in terms of depictions. I've written a lot of historical plays, but usually for the most part, they're kind of, they usually um, have focused around kind of post-war of independence in Ireland, which would have been around, you know, 1920s, late 1910s. So it was an opportunity for me to go back a little bit further into a part of history that I hadn't really worked with in before. And then coincidentally, I ended up working on the um, the adaptation of a, of a book by Thomas Kilroy called The Big Chapel, which... Um, was set in my hometown of Kilkenny and that would have set that was set in the late 1860s so all of a sudden I went from having uh, no kind of Victorian Ireland projects to having like two on the go at the same time which was nice but it, it is a very fascinating time and I do love history so it was nice to play in that sandbox for a little while. So you wrote the whole screenplay for all six episodes and then were you there on set when they were filming? I wasn't for the most part, actually, because there was there was a degree of like television production is very busy and like a lot of things change on the fly and can do so. I, I was rewriting for quite a bit 
I developed the show with Imogen Murphy, who directs four of the episodes. And myself and Imogen would have, we've been working on it since about 2014. She would have directed the initial video promos that we would have used in terms of like trying to pitch the show. And it was great then that she got to direct four of the episodes because obviously the two of us haven't developed the story together. It translated quite easily then when I wasn't on set, but, but she was. So I was doing a lot of rewriting. And then I played the character of Ozzy Burke, who's the medical examiner who crops up in one of the episodes. So I kind of got to go on set and do the fun thing of talking about how a person was murdered, walk around a body and, you know, spout my notes. It was good fun. Like the Alfred Hitchcock silhouette. It was, it was, yeah, it's like that. Yeah, just a, just a little bit, but a, a little bit more obvious. Well, I totally enjoyed watching the show. And I kept thinking, okay, the first episode is great. And I'm not going to spoil it for anyone who's listening. You have to watch the episodes. But I will say I watched it and I thought, okay, great. The main photographer is a postmortem photographer. And then there is a twist where the entire series revolves around a photographic mystery, an album of sorts uh, that is related to criminal activity. And I thought, this is brilliant. No one's ever done this before. One, when is the last movie you watched where a photographer is the main character, like seriously? Yeah, there's not a lot of them, really. No, <laughs> no especially not a post-mortem photographer. And then at the end of the first episode, the, one of the most brilliant parts of it is when Lennon Hassett sits down in his study, his den, and stares at a wall. And I'm not going to tell you what's on the wall. You know what's on the wall, and I know what's on the <laughs> wall. But I will say my mouth dropped open, and I was like, this is perfect. It's perfect. It gives you insight into his character and who he really is. And his character is so rich. They're all, it's the characterization in the series. It builds from episode to episode and you become quite attached to them. Like what's going to happen to his niece, Nancy? She has these grand schemes and Malloy, you bring him, of course, from the back streets of Dublin up to almost a middle class Irish existence where he's suddenly dressing in nice suits and top hats. And, and then Blenheim Hassett, I mean, you, you think of him one way and by the end of the series, you have a whole new understanding of depth into each one of their personalities. And I just want to say the detective, <laughs> he was great. He was great on so many levels and great for comic relief. So the, the foil between him and Blenheim Hassett is just perfectly done. So I want to thank you for that because that is very hard to do. Oh, great. Thanks very much. Yeah, like, in, interestingly, he was uh, the detective character, Frederick Reig, and he was kind of loosely based on Alphonse Bertillon, who would have been the, the French detective who popularized crime scene photography in the in, in the early 80s he like he was like he was an inspiration for that character and I remember reading about Bertillon in you know he was trying to popularize the use of basically mug shots initially and the, the the police force in Paris were quite resistant to it and you know he was quite dogged about it for a number of years and I thought that was a really nice idea for the character of Regan you know someone who was so somebody who's ahead of their time, you know, somebody who can see the potential in technology and is trying to persuade um, those around him to, to, to invest in it. And they absolutely won't, you know, for, you know, because of uh, you know, monetary reasons or just a lack of uh, imagination, I guess. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty glad you enjoyed that character. Yeah, very much so. He's so, as, as you said, dogged about it all. And then he's surrounded by all these people who are making fun of him all the time. And yet he's staying the course. He knows yeah. who he is. And then... The wife, they read these detective novels together. That was a nice touch. Oh, Very yeah. Fun. Yeah, she was, she was a really fun character. I, I, I like the idea of having a character who was a fan of detective fiction at the time because there was, there was so much of it. It was such a ripe time, you know, in terms of detective novels. Without getting too kind of meta about it, I just love the idea of this having a character who's completely literate you know and she's got detective fever and she's nearly as good a detective as anyone professional but unfortunately because of the restrictions placed on women at the time she couldn't properly exercise it so really her 
conduit for this was her husband's work. And she's, and as he said, I think he says it on the episodes, you know, she's just as good a detective as he is, if not better, you know, she's better than most detectives that he even knows. So that was a very fun dynamic to play with. Very fun. Very fun. So locally, there is a guy who actually has spent his entire life collecting uh, photographs of criminals. And he has a book called Least Wanted. And I ran into him at a local, you know, outdoor show when we could have them. And I remember talking to him endlessly. Every week I would go back and we'd have this conversation. And then I, you know, every so often buy something from him because I felt bad. I was sort of manipulating his whole time. <laughs> in that period, the period in which you cover in Dead Still, it was all about what a person looked like. You could look like a criminal and they would think you were a criminal. There were certain facial characteristics that yeah. were considered criminal. He has, I think, one of the largest collections in the world, and it is an international collection. Wow. Uh, so I'll put you in touch with him. I'm not right? sure where he is right now, but I think you, you do would have <laughs> a lot to talk busy. about. He's probably busy, right? Yeah. Uh, Least Wanted is the title of his book. As fascinating as the postmortem photography is, it's like a train, a, a car wreck you can't look away from when you, when you see these images. I'm not sure a lot of people understand the whole history of crime scene photography and how crucial it is to what these detectives did. Do you collect photographs? Yeah, like I, I have a lot of photographic collections, but most of my interest has been family connect collections. So, which I've, I've been, I suppose, uh, as I've been getting kind of older and as older relatives end up, you know, dying, it's something that I've uh, tried to keep track of quite a lot. So, yeah, over the last couple of years, particularly, I've been, I've been trying to uh, trying to get my hands on a lot of older family photographs and particularly just in terms of preservation, just making sure that things have been properly digitized and there's copies available for future generations. So that's something I've always been been interested in. I don't have a collection of um, memorial photography, unfortunately, or I probably should, but uh, they're hard enough to retrieve, you know, just by their very nature. But yeah, I do have an interest in that family photography, mostly. And I think it just comes from a place of wanting to secure your own heritage and making sure that it's, it's there and preserved for future generations. I wrote for an Irish magazine for a little while called Irish Roots. Oh, and yes. And I did a column on photographs, of course. And <laughs> we would put out calls for photographs from Irish families. You know, it's Irish-based. We want to talk about photographs taken in Ireland of Irish families, like the ones that you're collecting. And I used to joke that I thought that all of the photographs that existed in Ireland were actually taken in America and sent back by Irish immigrants, because we could never find Irish family pictures. There just didn't seem to be as, as many studios or as many people going to the studios. So when you're talking about your family collection, what's the earliest picture in your family collection? It's nothing, too, the, the earliest one that I have probably would have been photographs of my photographs of my grandfather who would have served in World War One, And they're just actually, I think they're just, from what I can tell with the photographs, they're just military photographs of the time. They're not any family portraits. So that, that's the earliest, I think probably would have been about 1917 or so. Exactly. And that's really the, the jumping off point for most family collections, including my own, is yeah. suddenly the price of photography goes down. And people have the ability to take pictures themselves with amateur cameras. But that whole studio photography thing, I think, left out a whole range of people who either didn't have the inclination or didn't have the extra money to go to the studio. Yeah, uh, that's, that's something certainly in terms of Dead Still that, you know, we tried to posit quite clearly that this, at the time, particularly in, in 1880, that it would have been the preserve of the upper and maybe upper middle classes. It wasn't, the cameras were not something that working class people had access to. You know, generations of, of families just went unphotographed. It wasn't a, there wasn't a record of them and it wasn't a collection. And that was something that fed into the Malloy character. There's a, I don't want to spoil the series, but you know, he, he's got a very personal reason for being very uh, passionate about, you know, pres preserving social history, preserving your neighborhoods and your communities and having photographs of your families. And I think he's certainly someone who's, part of the kind of uh, 
or at least is very enthused about the democratic process of people having access to cameras and being able to being able to take photographs but it would you know it wouldn't have been commonplace and and, and even in terms of ireland you know there's a I follow so many various kind of Instagram and, and, and like, you know, Twitter pages, et cetera, with, with old photographs of Ireland. Like, there, there's not a lot, you know, it, there isn't a huge amount, particularly in comparison to what you would have in Britain or the US. And that also stands for, for memorial photography as well, you know, because I'd seen some articles about Dead Still and people were kind of saying like, oh, it's this really weird Irish practice that they used to have. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's like, actually, for the most part, it would have mostly been American. Uh, and there's different permutations of it then in different, different cultures, you know, in Mexico or Indonesia or places like that who have similar but very different ways of taking photographs with the dead. Um, and I guess it all really depends on, on, on the culture, but it's certainly not a uniquely Irish thing. No, not at all. Not at all. And it's driven by a very basic need which is you want to be able to remember the face of the person who's deceased. And if you didn't have time to get a photograph or the money to get a photograph while they were alive, this is your last chance. Yeah. And, and, and I make that clear in a couple of instances in the series that that's, that's the driving force. Yeah. And it, it's also then that would have been it. People would save their money or give whatever ha- money that they have and see what kind of photographs that they could get. And it was even for poor families, you know, the quality of the photographer that they could have got probably would have been determined by that as well. And subsequently the, the quality of the photograph. But as you know, in the early 1880s as well, it is becoming more common. And as I said, there, there's a lot more amateur photography. So all of a sudden, because of this flourishing of photography, people just had people had more photographs of them when they were alive and that's what contributed to not the demise of memorial photography but certainly most types of memorial photography because i think like even nowadays memorial photography is still commonplace we just don't hear about it because it's behind closed doors and it's usually focused on infants who would not have had you know babies unfortunately who you know would have died at birth and the parents wouldn't have a photograph and that's I guess what the modern incarnation of it was, but certainly in Victorian times, as times progressed, you, you would have had more photographs of adults and then the need to have a photograph of them when they were deceased just suddenly became less significant. Well, you're absolutely correct. People think that post-mortem photography is something that's from the Victorian period and it didn't come forward, but in fact, it is still available today. You just, no, it's just no one really talks about it. Well, yeah, that's it. And I think we're so aware of the Victorian practice of it, obviously, because generations of families have kind of come and, come and gone. And then these photographs have kind of found their way out into the public sphere a little bit more as, as curios. And people find them to be kind of fascinating. And that's because we don't have that. There, there's a remove of a couple of generations there. But but it is, it is happening right now. And I suppose in terms of any kind of memorial and postmodern photography from now, it's probably not something that we, again, might see again, not for gen- generations to come. I think that's just the nature of the grieving process, that it's quite a private internal, internal thing that people mm-hmm. don't necessarily want to share in that regard. Well, I can say that you've done an amazing job of portraying the period in the screenplay. I get a little mixed up on the costume clues, I have to admit. I kept oh, saying, yeah. what period is this? This doesn't look oh like yeah, yeah. Uh, but you sort of let that go and just yeah. follow the story. Uh, there are a couple of yeah, there are always. I mean, it's, it's the same with history and even like some of the aspects of dialogue. You know that yeah, it's it's you're never going to get it entirely right. Right, exactly. Yeah. You sort of have to suspend the disbelief. Just suspend the disbelief. Yeah, that's it. And and then you really have done a masterful job of inserting comedy dark comedy in places where you wouldn't expect it and you find yourself laughing at what's happening. Now it has taken, it took you six years from the time you decided to write this with Imogene to get it to the screen. And at the end of the series, I was like, I wonder if there's going to be another one. Will there be another one? Will there be a second season? And how do you do that if it took you six years to write the first version? Hopefully it'll be a lot quicker the second time around because I, I guess a lot of the hard work is done in terms of creating the world and uh, you know casting the characters and designing it and all that. So that's already done. I, I don't know for sure that there's going to be a second series. I am currently working on it. 
so it's been written but uh, you know things are things are up in the air so it's it's very hard to tell how film production is going to go at the mo- moment or for the next couple of months but yeah certainly I, I, I would hope so that we get to do a second series and uh, I think you know with the second series the idea was always that it would delve a little bit more into the origins of of crime scene photography as we kind of begin to leave memorial photography uh, in the past and obviously then there's like there's there, for someone like Glenner Hassett whose focus is on making the dead look alive it, it would be very interesting to put him in, in, in a crime scene photography setting which is kind of similar to his practice but also at a remove and he's kind of starting from the bottom again so that's something I'd, I'd very much like to delve into if we get the opportunity but, but Malloy yeah he's yeah. a young man he would totally be into the new the new photography what you can yeah. do Oh, I think I think he, yeah, I think he would. I think where where Malloy is kind of where Malloy is moving at at the moment, I think in terms of how we're developing it. Like I mentioned, you know, the thing about Arthur Fields and the idea of street photography, but um, what I really would love to do with Malloy is get a portable camera into his hands and see what he can what he can do with it. So yeah, I've got a couple of ideas based around kind of customization and you know the which I'm kind of fascinated by the the idea of early handheld cameras and also reading about pinhole photography and like the earliest forms of hidden cameras hidden in hats or hidden in cravats so there's like from from a from a technological standpoint that that era in the 1880s into the early 1890s and particularly moving towards as well the advent of of cinema there's so much going on in in terms of photography that it's like there's almost endless material really for what you can delve into well I'm a big fan and I can't wait <laughs> because to have an entire so show based on historical photography is like a dream come true because it is so interesting. And as we were talking before we, we went live with this interview, it's like people think a photograph is a photograph and it's just a static image, but it's so much more. So much more. Yeah. So uh, much more. Yeah. And for, you know, particularly even with something like the photography of, of, the dead you know there's something quite impactful about that because it is it's the final image of someone it's someone in their final repose and there's certainly a weight that it that it carries and i think that's why they were given such a such a particular like memorial photography was given such a particular standing because it really just did represent an entire life and as we said and often and oftentimes in most cases you know that was the only representation of that person so that does certainly take on a an extra weight well, the people that collect postmortem photography are quite passionate about it. Yeah. So I'm sure that they have watched your show. <laughs> <laughs> and have a laundry list of grievances about it. <laughs> I, I, would, I would think they do. <laughs> yeah, I would yeah. imagine so too. Yeah. Yes. But I would like to say I hope people check out Dead Still on Acorn. It is six episodes. It's, it's wonderful. Thanks for any much. levels. And I hope you get another series and you can come back on The Photo Detective and we can talk about it all again. Oh, that would be wonderful. Yeah, I'd love to. There's, yeah, there's so much to talk about. So that would be fantastic. All right, John, you have a great day over there in Ireland. You too. And uh, talk to you again soon. Thanks so much.